Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news, you can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. Medical research scientists conduct clinical trials with the goal of transferring cutting edge information to healthcare providers. Healthcare providers can then use this new recent in information to improve the lives of their patients. Unfortunately, it takes about 17 years for research evidence to reach clinical practice. Today, we have a return guest, Waterford Institute's research scientist, Professor John Nolan. Dr. Nolan is here to share his top 10 research studies in the field of vision nutrition and age-related disease with the goal, shorten the time for cutting edge information to reach clinical practice. John, welcome back to the Open Your Eyes podcast. Hi, Carrie. it's a pleasure to join you again. You know, John, uh, before we get into the top 10 research studies, I really would like to help the audience. And we have a lot of people from the vision community, we have a lot of physicians, and we also have a lot of the public that watch this and people want to know how to interpret a clinical paper. And it's very difficult for the public and even for doctors, you know, we're not trained, whether we're medical doctors or, or optometrists, we're not really trained in understanding clinical papers. So if you could help us with that. So what is the, the beginning? What is the basis to help us begin with understanding a clinical paper? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Only yesterday I presented uh, one of our own studies at a, at a conference in the UK and it was very well received and a lot of interest. But one of the um, delegates queried the, the sample size of the, of the study and um, the gentleman was uh, quite critical, in fact, openly that it was a, what he thought was a small study, a sample size of 120 participants that we had um, tested over time. And I politely explained that you know, with this type of research, you know, of course you want large samples if you can get them, if you can get access to the large samples. But understanding uh, how the study is set up, how the study is designed and how we can kind of take meaning from what we find. And one of the points I made, and I think we go into the details a little bit about the different types of studies and how we should interpret the data within that, was that, you know, if you design a study, you design it in a way that you have an outcome measure that you're interested in, okay? So uh, the outcome that we may be interested in, in our case might be visual function. We might measure, for example, contrast sensitivity. Now that's a very different outcome measure to an outcome measure that is, let's say, um, will a patient develop age-related macular degeneration? So straight away, I'm looking at two, two areas of interest that are connected, but very, very different in terms of the, the type of variable that you look at in that study. In other words, in, in the research question where we want to look at contrast sensitivity, a functional measure that will change significantly if we have an effect of intervention, you may need a much smaller sample to demonstrate that effect. In the context of a disease where you're, that you're trying to stop a morphology of disease, the whole reason, or one of the reasons why they need such large samples in those study ARIDS, for example, was that the effects of, are very, very subtle over that time period on the, uh, on, the, on the condition. So I think one of the first points I'll make and one of the learnings from, 
for, for your listeners as to how they should do it is you must look at the totality of the data and the different types of data that's available. And all research starts at a situation, Kerry, where, you know, maybe in the first case, it's you're looking at animal studies. And if an animal study has an interest, let's say, with carotenoids, that you can have an effect in, in a mouse model, and this is all, all, of course, what happened, then you start looking at case studies, which are very, very small samples, but observations, if you like, and clinical observations are important. And essentially, you want that to scale into larger observations where you look at larger samples, ultimately then into what we call interventional studies, where you test your treatment in this case over a period of time and you have a very specific outcome measure. And if all of that um, and if your research question and your idea is correct, of course, what happens then is that, you know, you have what we call a meta-analysis, which is um, where other independent qualified experts will look at the totality of the data. They'll have very strict rules in how they do that. And then they make a judgment as to whether, you know, this treatment or this intervention or this research idea is correct or not. And, and that's kind of like this pyramid of excellence around, around science. But I think one of the things I'd like your listeners to take from this is that, you know, the design of the study and the quality of the study is essential, but I really believe in looking at the totality of the data. And that is everything from the case reports up to, up to the top level double blind placebo control trials. And there's one, there's one other important point maybe I should make before I let you back in. And that is, you know, we must understand in our field of research and in nutrition, because you and I carry have a passion for nutrition and how we can actually impact people's lives with, you know, lifestyle changes, nutritional intervention, supplementation. Um, you know, the type of research we do does not have access to the, the millions and the billions that pharmaceutical experiments will, will get access to. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take value from the different types of studies that scientists like me and doctors like you get to be part of and conduct where we can really learn and help patients. Let me bring us back to the real basics, like defining the study population, yeah. demographics. How do you go about keeping that equal uh, when you're doing a research study? Or what, how do you go about considering those two, considering yeah. those things when doing a study? A, a, a great question. And, you know, I teach on research methodology here in Waterford at, the, at what's now uh, going to be announced as a university. And when I'm teaching on the research methodology, the first, the first element of, um, I bring to the, the students that are learning how to do research is I ask them to put up their hands if anyone in the audience is, is a statistician and qualified statistician. And of course, none of them are qualified statisticians. So I say, OK, but you have a challenge. You need to do statistics. So I make a comparison to you know, um, basically I asked the question, how many people then can drive a car? And most people will put up their hand that they can drive a car. And the, the point here is that, you know, they may not be able to build an engine to drive a car, just like they may not be statisticians to, to really understand the nuts and bolts of statistics, but they need to figure out in a research study how to use the data and how to use the statistical programs to, to, to get that momentum in, in their research question to, to, to answer the questions and, and how we go about it. And to your question in terms of like, where do we start here? How do you even consider a sample? Okay, I, we never get access to the entire population. In, in any research question, say macular degeneration or macular pigment measurements, let's just say if the research question is, you know, what is the average measure of macular pigment in, in for every human being alive in New York? The way to answer that question is to measure everybody in, in New York. But of course, you're, you can't do that. It's not feasible to do that. So re all research at the very beginning becomes limited and biased in, in that you have to take a sample of the population of interest. And this is, you mentioned the word description. So we get a description of the population. And this is where your statistical models start to become important. Because what you have to do is to put effort in and you look at the feasibility. This is where I talk about feasibility of a study. So in the context of us measuring macular pigment in a population, somebody has to do it. You have to have enough instrumentation to do it. You have to have enough time to do it. You have to have the budget to support the people that are required to do it. So that's like, so you would design your study then, Kerry, to say, okay, I can get a sample of the entire population. 
And then the statistical and the research exercises to draw meaning from that sample, where you can learn something from that sample. And this is actually where, um, you know, uh, confidence intervals come into play. And one of the, st one of the uh, statistical outcomes, or you may see referenced in scientific papers, are confidence intervals. And essentially, confidence intervals are greatly influenced, Kerry, by the sample and the size of the sample that you have access to. The larger your sample, um, the more confidence you have around the measurements that you're doing, the mean and the outcomes that you get within that sample. So if you have a very small sample in a population, um, your, your confidence intervals will be um, less, less uh, stringent in terms of what we'll be able to infer from the statistics. So, so it's, there, there's mo many factors to it. Um, and it, one other point I'd like to make is that the sampling itself um, is essential. You know, so for if you were to do an experiment on, you know, measuring ma age-related macular degeneration, if you were to, to just randomly select people over a certain age, that's going to give you a good idea of the, the prevalence, let's say, at a point in time of macular degeneration. But if you were to just go into maybe a sports center and say, I want to measure everyone here for macular degeneration, and typically the average age may be you know, younger than the age at which we have the disease. So that's the wrong sample to go after. So study design and thought around how we um, get access to the sample is crucially important and then you know as we scale up this pyramid of scientific excellence in terms of the, the experiments we can do you might have um you know a description of a sample where you say oh everyone over the age of 60 um has a age-related macular degeneration if they have like a poor diet or they smoke cigarettes or, you know, so you can bring other categories into your research question. And this is where your, your case control come into it. If we're looking at cases, people with the disease and controls people without the disease. So um, it's the observations and the sampling and, and the statistics around how we do that are very, very valuable and, and not something to be forgotten in terms of interpreting research data and outcomes from research experiments. Well, you brought up the concept of bias before, and there was a sobering statistic that was released in STAT. Uh, Ed Silverman reported that uh, a new analysis finds 81% of authors who, whose work appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine or uh, JAMA failed to disclose that payments were, were made to them. And so how do we, so if 80% of uh, studies done in the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, uh, and then they didn't report that they were getting payments. How do we know what we could trust and what we can't trust when it comes to research science? Yes, well, I suppose like you're, you're kind of addressing a different issue. You're addressing bias related to conflicts of interest, which is a different type of bias to what you can have in a sample of, of, a, of research. Um, the best way to try and to, to address that issue would be and one would hope that the peer reviewed system will be able to look at the data and can other people conduct that same experiment and get the same result can they repeat and you know when we did a lot of our earlier work for example with mesoziazantin and we'll be speaking about it in the podcast today you know initially there was a lot of kind of um, I suppose uncertainty around it, whether it would be good to have mesoziazantin in the intervention or not. And there was lots of different um, schools of thought. But for me, the biggest validation of that was when other scientists um, used the, this intervention and were able to replicate the results. So I think uh, multi-central trials would be one way that you see that other people can do it and um, that the data is open, open access, that it's available for other people to see. Um, that it can be the analysis can be conducted on the data and that other interested uh, researchers can repeat the findings with access to the data that is a scientific right um, I've recently requested data um, that I I wanted to look at from a scientist because I was very very unsure about some of the outcomes of a particular study and I, I, I queried to get access to the data for that very reason because I believe that there's a bias in how, how, how this was done so um, there's loads of ways, I suppose, that 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 you can that you can and other people should and can challenge it. And this is where, for example, you know, even though we want to 
have a peer review system that protects the interested reader, the patient, the doctor, everyone, you know, there is an opportunity for experts to have a scientific discussion, um, even post uh, publication where you can have, you know, letter, letter critiques to the editor and so on that, that help you out. But I suppose to go back to your question, I mean, I don't necessarily have an issue. I mean, I, I'm at a show the weekend and every expert that's going to be there speaking on COPE are going to be paid by COPE to do their lecture. So there's a bias there straight away. It doesn't mean that they're presenting invalid data. It doesn't mean that, you know, the, the quality of the data will be dependent on the type of studies that they're presenting. In some cases, a lot of the information that's provided on these educational events are not even built from peer reviewed science. So one of the things I like to do, Kerry, when I do a lecture is make sure that the, the biologically plausible rationales that we're discussing, the results that we're presenting, and the conclusions that are, are born from the totality of the evidence is done from a peer reviewed scientific way. Um, notwithstanding, every study, Kerry, has challenges, limitations, biases. You never answer all the questions, but we have to progress with science in a way that when we get to the top of the pyramid, it means that you're our science is good enough that Dr. Kerry Gell believes that when he speaks to a patient who's at risk of macular degeneration or, or who has visual function problems, has enough confidence in the valid science to make a solid recommendation. And of course, you know my views on that. I believe the totality of the evidence around the use of the three carotenoids is, is, is very total and something that's uh, underused, in fact, in eye care and optometry across the world. Let's look at what supposedly is at the top of the pyramid, the double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial. But those trials are very expensive. Mm -hmm. They're typically uh, funded by Big Pharma or the government or a big donor that's connected with maybe Big Pharma. And uh, then there's other types of studies that we also get good information. So let's start off explaining what a randomized clinical trial is and is that the end all or be all? Because for somebody like myself, who's very interested in nutrition and lifestyle and staying healthy, a lot of times we're not gonna get those type of trials because they cost millions and millions, if not billions of dollars to conduct. And, but we wanna know is, you know, is our eggs good for me or are eggs bad for me? Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. So, what? You, you know, people don't have, there's not gonna be billions of dollars made on, on, on whether or not uh, vitamin C is good for me or bad for me. So we have to look at other data, but let's start off with the RCTs. Yeah. The, what are they and, and the pros and the cons? Abs absolutely, Will. Be before I do that, I could just want, kind of want to bottom out your last question as well, because I didn't, there was one element I, I maybe missed and you, you were saying, you know, going back to bias, one of the one of the um, safeguards that we did in our CREST trial, for example, was that we had a data safety and monitoring committee. And what that, what, what that meant was that the, the research question for the CREST trial um, was published before the trial began. So the primary outcome measure, contrast sensitivity at six cycles per degree was, was described before the experiment began. And all the data was was safeguarded and connected and analyzed independently even to the to the researchers that were kind of conducting the experiment so that's one thing i'd always look for DSM. i appreciate that is yeah, that is that, a, is that a european thing or is that something no that's no that's international yeah, all the big trials um would you know you look at arids um a bosch and lom would have been a conflict of interest there of course but i would hope and i would imagine that there was a dsmc a data and safety and monitoring um committee there uh we we've used them in two uh, two big trials that we ran one our compass trial and one the crest trial and it makes it very you know what that means basically Kerry, is you can't go back to the data you know and kind of reconfigure your statistical modeling how you know you you set out at the beginning exactly what you're going to do the, the statistical tests you're going to apply how you're going to treat the data and, and that's why you can't change that at the end. So you either pass or fail, and that's really the top level. So now moving into your question about like, what should we do? I really wanna bring back in the idea of the 
the the the the number needed to treat and the power of well, the before sound. you go into this ex explain what a randomized clinical control trial okay. is and then okay. we're gonna and then we're gonna explain what a cross-sectional study is okay of course yeah so a randomized clinical control trial there's different types so you can have a double blind or you can have a single blind so in a in a in a placebo controlled trial that means that you have a placebo group which is a an intervention that has none of the proposed active ingredients in it, or you have the active intervention, which in our case typically are the carotenoids. And the research question is that if you give the carotenoids, we'll improve macular pigment, we'll enhance vision and reduce risk of, of AMD. So what you want to get to is a situation that this is a randomized trial. So as you're um, recruiting patients into the trial, they're randomly assigned to uh, either the active or the placebo group. And if you do that correctly, and the statistical ways that we do that, basically what that means, Kerry, is that if we end up with a sample of 200 people, 100 of them are going to be on the active group, 100 are going to be on the placebo group, and they're going to be equally um, assigned. So that means you're going to have statistically similar number of males and females in each arm. We call them arms of the trial. You're going to have similar body fats on average uh, in, in each arm of the trial. There's going to have similar, similar number of cigarette smokers. You're going to have a similar measure of macular pigment to begin with, similar risk of disease, if you like, to begin with. So you're comparing at the outset apples with apples, okay, because they're, they're allocated, they're randomized. We use what's called a block randomization, and we do that because we, we do it in sections, which means that maybe for the first 20 uh, participants, if the trial, for whatever reason, had to stop, even at that point, you're going to have equal numbers. So you can block it by any size. And typically, Kerry, the researchers should work with a medical statistician to even achieve that piece. And that's why when you hear me speak about the team effect, the multidisciplinary effect in order to conduct these experiments, it's not just John Nolan or uh, Professor Rena Mulcahy or, you know, uh, Marina Green. It's, 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 the, it's everyone's contribution. And, you know, just working with our statistician today, Warren Roach, our previous statistician, Dr. Jim Stack, you know, the, the work that the statisticians do and have done at the NRCI is just, it's, it's, we could never thank them enough for, for what they do because you do not get the trial. In a single blind trial then, this will be a situation, um, Kerry, where I'm going to, I have randomized, so I have my randomization, but the single blind nature may mean that the participants that are taking the intervention may not know what they're on. So they won't know if they're on the placebo or the active. Um, and maybe the researchers will know. And what this means therefore is that this, the, the quality of this study is much less than the double blind. When it becomes double blind or another way we put it is double mask. That means that both the, the people that are on the intervention and the researchers do not know uh, who's on what basically. So it's a very fair experiment and it reduces the risk of um, unwanted bias. You know, if you go into an experiment and you want the intervention to work, and I know that I'm after giving Kerry Gelb the active ingredient, does that influence how I'm going to work with the data? It shouldn't, but you protect against that by running this double blind. And that's what we've done in most of our recent trials like Crest and our recent Alzheimer's trials. There were double blind placebo controlled. And that additional layer then of protection is when you have the DSMC uh, involved where they really micromanage the data, codes are not broken until uh, the data uh, set is completed and signed off on. There's very, very strict rules to how we do that. So give me the pros and cons of these RCT trials. So the pros, the, the only pros of, of doing kind of uh, on, you know, on randomized uh, single blind are cost. It's quicker to do them. It's easier to do them. It's faster to do them. And but the advantage is you can learn a lot before you launch yourself into a major trial that costs. In our case, we spend millions on trials. You know, if we didn't do all the most trials, the earlier, which were single blind, we wouldn't have figured out how much of the active intervention we needed. We wouldn't have understood what test of, of vision we should really focus in on. So the, the value, the pros of these single blind trials are that um, you know you learn really how to design the ultimate experiment. Um, 
the cons are that there's question around bias, there's questions around would that result be repeated if you were to scale it and increase the sample and run your double blind placebo control. The double blind placebo control trial allows you uh, apply many different types of uh, very strict statistical modeling to the data set that you have. And ultimately, you said, are eggs good for us or bad for us? Are carotenoids good for us or bad for us? We can say because of Crest that carotenoids are good for vision. And that's why I'm so animated about Crest in terms of how I believe it should change what happens in optometry and at policy level, government. And to your point, with Crest, with these nutrition-like trials, we're never going to get access to the billions to do to where we can get, you know, 20 center managers um, and, you know, enough nutritional intervention to, in, to supplement hundreds of thousands of people and follow people over a long period of time. You know, you're talking so much money to do that. And, it's, and, and, and wrongly, it's because, you know, pharmaceutical companies are not motivated financially to invest in that type of trial. So unfortunately, finance always comes into the type of studies that we get access to. But, but you can do a lot of really good double blind placebo control trials with smaller samples if you power it appropriately. How about cross-sectional studies? Tell us what that is. So yeah, so cross-sectional study is a type of observational study. And, you know, where we all begin our research is, is where we will do a cross section of the population. My, for, my PhD work, which was so valuable, um, obviously to our own knowledge, but I believe to the field was a cross sectional study. It was a thousand people in the Irish population. So it was, it was uh, randomly selected um, with best efforts, um, people between the age of 18 and 60 years of age. Um, so we, we wanted to get a cross section. And the reason why we wanted that, that cross section was our primary measurement here was macular pigment for the first time to do it in a valid way. And what we wanted to do then, Kerry, was to categorize within that cross section um, people that had high macular pigment to see if there was any connection to the known and established risk factors for age related macular degeneration. Um, so, you know, that was cross-section and we didn't give them the carotenoid intervention. We didn't follow them over time, but such a wealth of information we got from that. Um, and that was really, really, and, and, and cross-sectional can, can, can become these cohort longitudinal studies thereafter where you um, get really valuable data, which is, so let's just say in that case, what if I was to follow that thousand people, Kerry, and look at um, followed them until they eventually got age-related macular degeneration or didn't at a certain age. And then I was able to trace that back to their baseline. That's how you really answer the question of whether, you know, having a nutrient like macular pigment, like the macular carotenoids, is, is going to protect you against the disease. The double-blind placebo-controlled trial doesn't even do that because it's narrowed to maybe a five-year period or a 10-year period. So, Cross-sectional studies are, are very valuable and they can be small. They can be a sample of 30, you know, a sample of a thousand, um, depending again on, on, on what the research question is. And, and then within those cross-sectional studies, Kerry, what we do is, you know, for your listeners, they'll be, how do we work with that data set? And I think this is something we should talk about. That, um, and statistics is actually not as complicated as, as, as it may appear to the untrained, uh, interested uh, reader or observer. With statistics, Kerry, it's really about understanding what type of data variables you're working with. And there's only two main types of data variables. There's data variables like that you have a measurement of, like body fat, that's something that has a unit, um, you know, uh, height, um, macular pigment is a measure. You actually measure something. So we call this um, continuous data. And then the other type of data we will call categorical data. So, um, you know, uh, it could maybe male or female, or it may be, um, you know, black eyes or brown eyes, blue eyes. So we have different categories. And within statistics, then, all, all that is, is collecting all these types of data. And you may end up a classic data set that we would work with might have 50 variables. And it, it will be a mix of your continuous data and your categorical data. And what the scientists then have to do is to look at that data sample. Remember, going back to our first 
the point. We have a sample of the population that we're interested in. And you can ask research questions of that data and draw meaning from that data by looking at, you know, means of it, by look, you know, the mean of the sample. So what's the average amount of macular pigment in that population? Um, and that's looking at what we call univariate, maybe looking at one variable. It becomes interesting when you bring in other variables into the statistical model. The question may become, you know, is macular pigment different between um, people with blue eyes and brown eyes? That might be a question. So now we're looking at a bivariable data set. And there's actually only a bunch of tests that you need to kind of be trained to use that you can employ to the data sets. Ultimately, and you, we come to what, what people look for, what they should look for, is, is there statistical significance in the research question? So let's keep it simple. Do people with brown eyes have significantly lower or higher macro people pigment than people with blue eyes? Essentially, you do what we call a t-test there, an independent sample t-test, and you compare the people with brown eyes to those with blue eyes. That's the two categories. And then the, the, the continuous variable in this case is your measurement of, of macular pigment. And if it's statistically significant, um, your p-value will be um, classically less, p is less than 0 0.05, which means that there's a 95% probability that your finding is correct and that the, the null hypothesis is incorrect. The null hypothesis is basically the, the hypothesis that the researcher is trying to disprove. So, um, but p-values are very valuable. You need to look for them, but on their own, they don't really tell us the whole story of the research. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. We're going to get into the statistics in just a minute. I think you make a great point. The totality of the information is what helps the doctors make a clinical decision in, in helping their patients because we have the, the different types of studies. But then, you know, probably only about, you know, I've seen reports less than 20% of what physicians do are really this clinical study. So, you know, there's this clinical experience, there's case studies. And I want to ask you about the Cochrane database. Uh, you know, they seem to almost be like the arbiter of what's what's real and what's not real. If you could comment about the Cochrane database. Yeah, Co Cochrane was introduced following a very um, strict critique of, you know, again, back to your question of, um, you know, Big Pharma being involved with treatments and interventions. And, um, and when Cochrane got involved, basically what Cochrane is, is it's, 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 it's people that would take, for example, the Crest data and look at the Crest data in connection with, you know, other similar experiments. So typically, you were right, if you pass on a systematic Cochrane review, it means that the, the research that you've done and that you said to be effective is, is truly, truly effective. So essentially what it is, Carrie, is it's, it's an appropriate, trained, qualified, um, bunch of scientists not just one it has to be more than one that look at um different studies that make the same claim to see if the if, if the, the studies were conducted correctly if the outcomes from the study answer the question the way they said and if the totality of the evidence adds up to that and if you pass on a systematic Co cochrane review you really have answered something important in science I was talking a little bit about observational studies, and there was a, a study that showed that they looked at 100 trials, and they found that the observational studies and randomized clinical trials, which were so expensive, were basically giving the same information that, yeah. uh, so, which applies to us in a way, you know, as a physician, is, you know, I can't always get randomized clinical trials because it's so expensive, so we have to, we have to rely on observational studies and we have to re uh, rely on case studies sometimes and, and, and just seeing patients in general. So if you could make a comment about observational studies and that report that showed that the outcomes weren't really that much different when they compared them against RCTs. No, 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 they're not. And it's typically back to kind of everything I believe in with, with you know, yes, there, there, there's a requirement to do your double blind placebo control large sample trial. 
But you know what I've seen? My experience is that even in, you know, when I look at very small samples, it, and if I have my measurements sensitive and correct, I'm going to get the same result with a very small sample as I will with a, with a large sample. Or, and as you say, even before we move to the interventional trials, if we look at our own area of research with carotenoids and the first observational major study, you may remember Joanna Setton's work, which is she did a, an observational study, which was a case control. So she looked at patients with macular degeneration and she measured lutein. That's what she did back in the day before any intervention. And her, the conclusion was that carotenoids, lutein and the other isomers were significantly lower in the patients with macular degeneration than the patients of the same age. This was the control group, but who didn't have macular degeneration. And also and what, a cataract as well, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. So, I mean, there's just so much evidence, the observational studies. And that's why I, I really like what you say, actually. And that is, you know, looking at the totality of the evidence that's available. Sometimes in medicine, particularly in ophthalmology, we'll see, you know, retinal surgeons will dismiss you know, all these other types of studies and they want to look for the big trial, the double blind placebo controlled interventional trial. What did, and you know why they do that? It, let's just be open about it. It's, 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 it's the fear of an ophthalmologist um, making a wrong decision. They're just, and I understand it. They're, they're, they're trained to just live in a classic top level of evidence base. So a recommendation that a medical doctor will make um is 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 you know it's it's based upon that uh, and that's why they default to 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 the to the interventional double blind placebo controlled trials so i think therefore when we talk about the totality of the evidence as well it kind of comes back to your knowledge of the area and 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 work that's done throughout the the pyramid of evidence that speaks to things like uh, safety and contraindications and you know, stability and bioavailability. This is all evidence that we should be, that, you know, when I'm speaking at my events, I'm very clear on, you know, using the three carotenoids. I'm very clear on using the three carotenoids that have been formulated in, in, in a very safe way that it's stable. And this is all building blocks of evidence, Kerry, isn't it? That, 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 that lead to an ultimate recommendation. That's that top of the pyramid, remember, that you, Kerry, make a decision in your clinic. And, and I suppose what I'm saying in our field, it's absolutely time that the eye care specialists have the comfort and the confidence to make a recommendation about nutrition, lifestyle intervention, and, and absolutely supplementation. Um, but, but using the levels of evidence, the types of different types of studies that have informed our research question. Uh, we're going to get into interpreting the clinical data, but before we do that, uh, you did mention. Uh, a study that you did this weekend that you reported on is that something that's in the top 10 or it's not in the top 10 um that you're gonna actually it, it wasn't in the top 10 so I'm... since our people are watching can you give us a can you give us the the bottom line of what you reported on this weekend at, at the yeah. conference yeah it was at a conference called 100 optical and um it, it was it was a very new area of research for me. You're going to be interested in this. It's moving off topic, but it's in the area of um, the vitreous and vitreous floaters. And, you know, essentially um, about seven years ago, we started um, a whole PhD research program. It was a, an industry co-fund. There was a German company involved um, and it was an independent uh, piece, platform of research that was established. And the basic in the first number of years, we really just wanted to study the literature about uh, the vitreous. And there's a very um, successful and famous doctor in America, Dr. Sivak from California, who's a, a very well-known uh, vitreous specialist. And um, we were studying all that work essentially. And long story sh short, building upon the knowledge um, that we created from all our macular carotenoid work in terms of how the use of targeted nutrition for the macula was so useful and beneficial. The concept was, is there something similar we can do with the vitreous? You know, it's a very different system, of course, it's water soluble. The classic view is that the vitreous is a closed system, um, but it's not. The, you know, the vitreous is an open system. Of course, the vitreous is in basic principles, is a, and it's totally looked through and Sibak has this lovely phrase, 
And I think that was the title of my lecture was um, look at the vitreous, not through it. And when you look at the vitreous, we see that, um, you know, obviously what happens is the with vitreous degeneration and liquid fraction, you get the um, conglomerates of the collagen fibers, which remarkably, Kerry, are the result of oxidation. Mm. The oxidative result of stress. Oxidation, it always comes back to oxidative comes, stress, right? And inflammation. So, so tell me, what's, what did you find? What are the ingredients that uh, could help us with floaters that you reported on? So when we looked at and we, we conducted a major review on this, and it's remarkable the amount of antioxidants that are actually present in the vitreous and they're um, endogenous and exogenous. So some that are naturally present, some that you have to take in to the system. But essentially, the first piece of research was to narrow that down to the ones that are most concentrated, to the ones that have, um, uh, you know, quality in terms of, uh, you know, that we know that they have antioxidant, anti-glycation properties. Um, and they were zinc, um, vitamin C, uh, grapeseed extract. Um, so the bioflavonoids and L-lysine, they were the combined synergistic ingredients that we're using. So en enzymatic effects as well of this. And this has been used, by the way, well, this was the first major proper trial that we that we we tested. This has been used for over a decade, um, this type of intervention in Germany, for example. And um, so, yeah, this is this is new, actually. And I know it's this is an intervention that um, will be available in, in America very, very, very soon. As and, well. it, it, and it decreased floaters by 70 percent. Is that what it showed? So no, sorry. Let me let me clarify it. It the positive effect when we quantified the effect of floaters in patients over say their their daily lives and over the previous six months, there was a seventy percent of patients on the active group had a significant improvement in those assessments that questionnaire. It decreased floaters by about half. So the volume of floaters that we could quantify and we absolutely measured them in a very valid way. Um, we used the Heidelberg system. We were able to uh, basically uh, map them. We were able to trace them and quantify the scale of them. And we repeated that experiment on both observations on three different times. And the ICC, which we call interclass correlations were almost, they were perfect. It was 0.99. So really, really valid assessment. So the nice thing, and we also measured visual functions. You know, I care optometry really will trivialize floaters. I mean, the current treatment for vitreous floaters is do nothing, right? Um, and the, the reason being is A, we don't know what to do or didn't know what to do. And B, you know, vitrectomies and, and, and laser surgeons, 99% of them won't do that because they're very worried about end endophthalmitis. They're very worried about, you know, the risks associated. We know that vitrectomies work you know, 100% they work, but, you know, people are allowed to live with floaters and some people live with them fine. But, you know, honestly, if you do, if you do um, look at this in your own clinics for your listeners, you'll see that your patients are really, really unhappy, you know, and this has been quantified by the um, utility values where uh, SIBAC published on this, Kerry. And you, you may be surprised to see that the impact of floaters on patients' lives is, that, is as significant as uh, AMD and greater than those with um, diabetic retinopathy in terms of the impact on quality of life. So it's a major problem that's totally uh, untreated. And I believe, and you like this, because I know your passion for nutrition, that, you know, we're not saying nutrition is going to fix vitreal degeneration um, or vitreous degeneration, but it's just like what we're able to do with macular degeneration. It's definitely a solution to help um, reduce the burden of, 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 of these types of degeneration and the consequence of vitreous floaters. From someone who sees patients on a regular basis, I can tell you they hate floaters. And yeah. unfortunately, we really didn't have a great solution for them. I mean, I did a podcast that, uh, with uh, a retina specialist and we talked about vitrectomy or we talked about mm -hmm. doing uh, laser treatment for it. But I mean, you know, certainly if there's a supplement, that may be able to help them, that, that would really be something that would be special before you have to do something invasive because you could blast with a laser one of these floaters and then you get all these tiny little floaters. And yeah, you know, that's right. Or, or, you know, doing a vitrectomy is, is, is a surgical procedure. Yeah, so, I mean, can I tell you, 
can I tell you something? You know, I've, I've always taken the carotenoids myself and I still do. I can show you, I measure my skin carotenoid score here. It's off the chart. And I, so my wife and I would take carotenoids every day. But in January, um, I was at a, a, an optometry conference at Island Eyes in Hawaii. And I, I'll tell you this, it's kind of off, off, off the beat of science, but I had a very difficult experience. I, I almost drowned. I was, um, I was out for a morning run and I was, it was very early because I was still on Irish time and it was, it was 7.30 in the morning. So I decided to go for a swim and I went for my swim and there was nobody on the beach. It was, the beach was about a half a mile long and long story short, um, a, a massive, I didn't go out too far, but a massive wave came and took me up and mm. it had happened to me before. It was fine. I kind of found it funny in the beginning, but I ended up, Kerry, fighting for my life. Um, really? really, really did. And uh, could see people see, could see me for the cliff from the cliff that they were walking. But thankfully, out of nowhere, this um, young local gentleman with a surfboard saw me and saved me. Uh, following that incident, I, I play tennis regularly. I, it's a sport I enjoy at the moment. Um, and the, the impact of floaters for me personally, when I came back in January to the point that I stopped one tennis game. So I said, look, I'm going to try this. And here's our case study, right? Here's our N equals one, John Nolan. I tried it and I'm remarkable. I'm, I take it every day now. I still have, I still have some floaters, but to the point that it's totally manageable, less bothersome. So, but in the experiment, look, we, we, we had a very good result. Um, there's been other experiments done to our conversation today. We, there was observational work done with, with this in, with floaters, how we quantify them, these type of intervention. There was single blind trial done, but the PhD program that we've just published from Emmanuel. And it's all, all these papers are in, in uh, actually in the Arvo journal um, uh, available now, published at the end of last year. So it's a new venture for us. And I was very reluctant to move away from like macular nutrition. Obviously we're in the brain nutrition, you and I have spoken about that, but, but what we've learned now, it needs more research. But what we have now is really, really exciting and um, something that you should certainly try for sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, now let's go into some of the statistics to help our audience understand some of it. So first, let's start with number needed to treat, NNT. If you could kind of explain what that is. So the number needed to treat, um, as, I, as I interpret it and as I work with it, is the number that you'll need to test your hypothesis that, to, that, you're, that it's powered to likely to have an effect. Um, so it all depends on your outcome measure. So if you want to fix a disease, Kerry, you're, you're going to have to have a really large sample. But how do we know the number needed to treat is one way to address this question. You actually need to go to have exploratory data you need to have what we call an effect size. You need to be able to look at historical data and see that if I give somebody 20 milligrams of lutein, I can change macular pigment by X. So then when you design your top level trial, you will be able to use the historical data to with your outcome measure and access to variables. And this is where the statistician typically comes in. You see it in every paper. It's in every paper that you probably pass over, which is the sample size calculation, um, you know, the number needed to treat within that. And it's with best efforts. You never design an experiment, or you shouldn't at least, that's likely to fail. When you spend the money and when you put the time in, the ethics of this, of working with people, are that you have to have done the best efforts to address the research question. So it totally depends, Kerry, on your research question and what you're trying to achieve. If I'm trying to increase macular pigment, I can demonstrate that in 20 people. If I'm trying to enhance visual function, I typically need 120 people um, over a 24-month period. That's where you really get the hits, 12 months anyway. If I want to fix macular degeneration like ARIDS, you'll be looking at 5,000 people, longer intervention. So if we were, so for an example, you'd have to give people a certain amount, amount of statin drugs so you have to give it to 150 people to prevent one heart attack. So something like that. Uh, to to, to a point, I, I suppose what I'm saying is you can never calculate your number needed to treat unless you have access to historical data. Otherwise, it's just a fishing exhibition. I see. Now let's go to odds ratio. Exposure versus non-exposed exposure. Yeah. 
so so the odds ratio again this is classically used in in medical statistics um and the, the best way i explain this is that so if you want to look at the odds of something so and and typically these these statistical methods like odds ratios and so on are are, are statistical test statistical theorems that are, that are applied to the data sample that we spoke about the data sample so now we're going to apply a statistical test to answer a question on the sample that we have access to so if you look at an odds ratio basically um you will ideally you will need an active and a placebo again okay so now we're back to our standard study design and we might look at say you know, I'll give you a silly example. Let's just say the number of people with COVID that are likely to have dinner, okay, versus um, people free of COVID that are likely to have dinner. I mean, it's a crazy example, but just, just to make the point, you need the two different arms of intervention to look at. And essentially what you do is you look at the odds of that happening, the prevalence of that happening, the number of people with COVID that had dinner versus the number of people without COVID that had dinner and you can calculate the the odds within that the, the prevalence of the number of people that had within that and then you can get the ratio of one to the other you know what i mean so it's it's that's where the ratio comes in so um you know the higher the ratio um the more likely it is to to to, to have have the effect if the ratio is at one there's no effect so as you move as you move either side of that, depending on the positivity or negativity, you're going to have the effect. So if it's at two, it's a hundred percent in the odds of the outcome. Exactly. So let's move to a hazard ratio. I'm reading a study. I see the odds ratio now. I understand that. But how about hazard ratio? Help us understand what that means. So a hazard ratio is is like um, it's built on what they call survival anal analysis. Um, and the hazard ratio is, um, you know, you maybe it's 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 the calculation of a, of an event at a particular time point. So it might be the number of people that were vaccinated versus weren't vaccinated that that actually got COVID, for example. So that might be one. So you'd have to look at a particular time point and calculate the differences. So if you if you know a hazard ratio of of two would be you'd be two times more likely to develop COVID if you weren't vaccinated than someone that was vaccinated, for example. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a risk. Another way to look at it is the risk rate, so relative risk. So it's the risk of an event happening. And it's, it's built on what we call survival analysis. So you have to, ha again, have access to a sample. Classically, you, you will have a treatment um, and a control. And essentially, just like all good experiments, you'll be comparing one to the other. And if there is no difference if there is no difference between them, you know, you, you will see that in your survival analysis. Essentially, the lines will stay together, but and, and they won't separate. So are you more likely to, to develop COVID and based on lifestyle, um, based on your, your immunity, for example? There can be multiple different type questions. And they're very, very classic in, in medical statistics to look at, at that type of data. So if it's a 1.2, then you have a 20%, 20%. You know, benefit. 20% yeah. of the people benefited from that particular medication. If you or 20 it. times more likely to have an event. That's another way to look at it. It depends on, it depends, again, it depends on the research question, right? And relative risk, you kind of put those kind together. Of relative risk is built into that. They're, they're kind of the same. They're similar, but different. Um, risk, uh, the, the odds ratio our relative risks hazard ratio, for example, um, looks at um, the hazard at one time point. The the relative risk looks at it across the across the curve, across the time point. So it takes multiple factors into consideration at different time points, essentially. So relative risk versus absolute risk. Yeah, that's 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 the way I would look at it. Yeah, relative risk versus absolute risk. Yeah. Confidence. But, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I think we've covered. I mean. What, what, what I will say to you, because I don't want the listeners to think, God, I don't understand this. You know, it's, 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 it, I think they've learned from, from listening to our discussion today that it's all about the type of study design. And, you know, you can apply different theorems, different statistical tests to that data sample. And, and the hope is, and the job of peer review again, is that the, 
the, the reviewers of the of the paper will make sure that the scientists are using the right statistical questions, whether it's like a, an odds ratio. I think that's what they used in, in Arads, the odds ratio, wasn't it? Um, uh, or if you're using, you know, and it goes back to what I said about the type of data that we have access to. You know, is it continuous data? Have you multiple time points? I like to use, because I work with continuous data, Kerry, and I like to use what's called a repeated measures analysis of variance. Ultimately, it's going to tell me whether there's a statistically significant effect, okay? Um, and, and that is basically, in that situation, all of these are creating equations, statistical models that take into consideration various elements of, of the variables that you have, like does, does variable A correlate with variable B? And you must look at the data not just from statistics, but you must visualize the data. That's why we, we plot the data. You, you see, if you're looking at the relationship between X and Y, you know, body fat and macular pigment, you plot it and you look at it. Does, if body fat goes, increases, does macular pigment decrease, for example? So you must put the data available for visual as well. So it's the totality of the information in statistics, not just a p-value or an odds ratio or a relative risk that tells you. Um, but all very, very appropriate and valid uh, statistical ways to look at data. And they're all interlinked. I think we were talking about confidence intervals now. And confidence interval would be the next. Yeah. So confidence interval, and we've kind of addressed it a little bit, but it's, it's a really important one. You see it in most papers. Um, it goes back to the sampling. OK. And, uh, and what you want to do, and let's just say I have an orchard and I have a uh, hundred apples in the orchard and, the, and I want to know the mean weight of the apple. What's the average weight of the apple? Well, if I sample two apples and calculate the weight of the two apples, um, I'm not going to have a lot of confidence as to whether I'm right or not. Um, and particularly if apple one is very different to apple two, now I have variation within a small sample. So ideally you want the entire population of the orchard, all of the orchard. And so ultimately confidence intervals um, is essentially the likelihood of the mean value of the sample that you have access, um, access to being representative of the total uh, sample. And, and that's why in observational studies, and when we're comparing case controls, we're looking at, at comfort that are there, you know, with is it point A to B, you know, is the confidence interval narrow or is it broad? But it, it's all interlinked to the size of the sample you have access to, the, the variability, the variance around that. Um, and then I suppose we're going to land on the P value, are we? We're going to land on the P value, but back to confidence. So if there's a 95%, that means that there's a 95% confidence that what we're measuring is correct. It means that the mean value, the score you get, the result you get is going to be between point A and B. Okay. Between, so if you think of the curve, so the confidence is going to be, you're 95% confident that the score you get is going to be within that, within that range. So if you, if you have a very homogeneous representative sample that's narrow, you have a very small confidence or oh, sorry, you have a very small variation, you're going to be very confident that you're 95% confident that it's going to be between A and B. Now, A and B can change. It can be very broad. That's where you, you know, you, it, um, and that affects the statistical significance or it can be very narrow. And, um, and, and that's what you want. You want accuracy in your measurement. You want representation of, of what we're doing here. And again, that comes back to study design. And the p-value, the probability value. So the p-value is, is basically the likelihood that the null hypothesis was, was incorrect. So essentially, the p-value is, is basically, um, we use 95%. It's very arbitrary. And actually, the, the statistician that I work with doesn't like p-values. He likes, because he likes effect size. So the effect side is kind of like the, the, the magnitude of the, the effect that it has, the relationship between X and Y. So measure the, so for example, measure the impact. What's the effect size of changing macular pigment by X to achieve a, an improvement in visual function by Y? For him, uh, Warren Roach is his name. He's a brilliant young statistician. Um, for him, that tells you much more than, like, let's just, Look at p-value for a second. It's 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 the probability that if you um, are to repeat 
that experiment again with the same sample that you're going to get uh, the same answer. So that we, we arbitrarily cut it off at 90, uh, 95%. Um, so P is less than 0 0.05. That's what that means. And status, researchers jump up and down if the P value is less than uh, 0 0.05, because now they can write in their paper, it's statistically significant. But what does that actually mean? Right. right. You know, so the lower the number with the p value, everything's always opposite. It, it is well, well, no. I mean, the lower the number, the better for sure. And the closer you get to zero, like a p value is less than 0 0.001, it's highly significant. Right. Um. But I suppose the point being is it doesn't give you the full picture. And right. you know, again, back to big right. pharma, right. one of the reasons why you need five thousand people is to get a p value. I'm more interested to see the effect size, like Warren says, or, you know, I, I, I mentioned the, the, the correl the relate, a measure of the relationship. If, so if you wanted to, if you were to do a small experiment, Kerry, and measure macular pigment in, in 10 people in your clinic, the next 10 people you see, and, and if you were to measure um, the, med the change in their contrast sensitivity. So we can look at that data in different ways. We can look at, um, the change over time and get a p-value. We can do a, a paired samples t-test, which will give you a p-value. So how does subject A change at time point one to time point two and so on and so forth. Um, and you'll get a p-value. Now, the point is, Kerry, if you have 10, you may, you're unlikely to have a statistical effect. The p-value is unlikely to be less than 0.05. Um, but if you have 100 and there is some relationship, it's highly likely to be statistically significant. Because what it's saying is that, you know, so the power of your sample is increased. So the likelihood of your p-value giving you uh, a positive outcome increases with larger sample. This is my point. So you must look at other elements of the data and you must look at when, so when you're reading a paper, because this is one of the points we're trying to establish here for your listeners and viewers that how can they interpret it? Look at the data. Look at the, I like to look at what I call correlations. Pearson correlations, if, if the data is normally distributed, um, the closer to one on a Pearson means that if I change macular pigment by 50%, I'll change contrast sensitivity by 50%. That's a 100% correlation. It never works like that, but that would be a perfect outcome. So now I'm going to have a statistically significant result. The P will be less than 0 0.05, but my correlation is going to be uh, maybe 0 0.85 or 0 0.9. And now I know that I have an effect size that's meaningful. So in our last paper, we actually didn't publish p-value. We it's in the clinical uh, Rebecca Powers work, and and Warren was the statistician on it. Um, the journal doesn't publish p-value. It looks at effect size, so it's essentially a measure of the magnitude of the effect, a magnitude of the relationship. How important is it? Do you know what it does, Kerry? It brings clinical significance into the game, as opposed to just statistical significance. You brought up correlation, and a lot of times correlation will be used. Explain that, and what's a good number, and what's really not such a good number. Okay, yeah. So correlation. In order to look at a correlation, you need at least two variables, because you need. That's what a correlation is. It's another correlation is another name for a relationship, and to have a relationship, you have to have two. So, and typically in science, you have an x-axis and a y-axis. Your x-axis is your dependent variable. So in this case, it may be, um, okay, I may be reporting on the change in lutein. As, so that's on your x-axis. And now what I'm interested in is the change in macular pigment. So I will correlate the change in lutein versus the change in macular pigment. And you would expect the research question is, the hypothesis is that if I change, the, the bigger the change in lutein, the bigger the change in macular pigment. That's a basic hypothesis, right? So you, you measure maybe 50 people, okay? And so you get the absolute numbers and you put them into a spreadsheet and then you do a correlation. And uh, we call it, um, you do graphically, you do a scatter plot. So you it plots all the data and you'll see that people that have say 100% change will have an, a significant, maybe an 80% change in macular pigment. And those that have a small change, what you wanna see is those that have a small change in lutein in the blood, those who maybe didn't comply to the intervention or, or were bad responders will have a small change in, in macular pigment. And if you do that and you have a strong correlation, you ideally, that a good score, to answer your question, is one. And that, that means you have 100% agreement. And you never get 100% agreement in, in human statistics. But like, 
in our new work, when we use the, the triple carotenoids, we're at about 80% prediction. So we can predict the change in macular pigment by 80% almost by the amount of change we have in, in, in the blood levels. And now we know we're really measuring right, we have the right intervention. So it's, it's the totality of the statistics equal the scatter plot, the presentation of that. Um, it is the, we're interested in the p-value. So when I'm writing the sentence, I'll say there was a statistically significant relationship between serum lutein and macular pigment. I'll go, so that's the sentence and I teach the PhDs how to write like this, open brackets, or equals, or I'll give you the correlation, which is you want it to be close to one carry, one equals 100% agreement. Uh, point two is, you know, 20% or no, well, I'd have to square it, but it, may, it would be about 10% agreement, okay? So it goes, the lower to closer to zero, the less of the agreement. The higher you go to one, the higher statistical significance. Does that make sense? Yes, so if, I, if it's 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7, is that still good? Very good. You know, 0. 0.6 means what you have to do is square it, but not to get too complicated. So if you look at your standard R, we call it R. It's, it's called a Pearson correlation when it's normally distributed. That's when the data is normal. If it's not normally distributed, it's called Spearman. But not to complicate it, an R, you have to square the R to get the R squared. An R squared of 0.2 means 20%. 20% of the change in macular pigment is due to the change in lutein. I'm, so glad, you, I'm glad you said it because in, in my study that we did where we correlated uh, microaneurysms and insulin resistance, we I think we were at 0.6 or 0.7. So. 0.6 of an R. So that's a very, when I look at that, I call that... Um, there's three ways I present it. It's like weak. You can have a weak correlation that still is like statistically significant and maybe even clinically significant. And they're somewhere in the region of like, uh, when we look at the R's, the correlation statistic of about, you know, maybe point one to, sorry, point one to 1.5 kind of thing. So, you know, anything below kind of point one is kind of noise. Um, once you go above one, it's still very weak at that level. But it's starting to say that, X is equal to Y in some way. And as you move up to your point sixes, now I'd call that a, um, a medium relationship, a medium to strong. But, you know, you, in, like in the laboratory, when you're doing, when we're concentrating lutein to do what we call a standard curve, our, our uh, analytical chemists, <laughs> it's so funny, they'll throw out a whole set of analysis that's not 0.9999. Because like it, X has to equal Y in their world. Right, right, you know, they're right. dealing with, they're concentrating them, they're scaling it. So they're, and so that's why you have to understand the data sets you're working with as well. But if I can say by changing macular pigment, I can change vision by, if it's a 20% predictor, that's massive in, this, in the scheme of things. So vision science, health statistics need a whole uh, uh, approach. But ultimately, I think the most important thing we've said today is that your sampling is crucial. You can apply many different types of tests to your sample. And that's where your statistics begin in your sampling methodologies. Before we get into the top 10 studies, my last question in this segment, I want to ask you about what, what a lot of times Big Pharma or who's ever doing studies, they don't report data. They don't get the they don't get the outcome they want. And then they repeat the study and then they repeat the study and they repeat the study until they do get the outcome they want. Yeah, I mean that shouldn't be allowed. And that's, again, we, we spoke about data safety and monitoring committee today. Um, and, you know, that, that the duty of this, how the data sets are, are managed, um, who are the investigators, conflicts of interest, ethical IRV or blue, clinical trial registration. There's all of these safeguards that should be in play. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say about that. I, I just think that in the context of what we do, the earlier studies, the exploratory works were so valuable to lead us up to where we are. Well, I want to thank you, John, for this, this segment uh, to help our doctors and help the public to understand clinical studies a little bit better because there's about 2.5 million clinical studies that are released every year. So there's a lot of great research being done by our scientists around the world, uh, around the United States, also in Europe and around the world, and to help the doctors to be better doctors, to give better information to their patients so we can help our patients. So I want to thank you for that, John. Pleasure. Thank you.
Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also going to be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.